Professor Brown uh, is uh, Associate Dean of Research, Innovation and Global Affairs in uh, and a full professor of medicinal chemistry and pharmacology at Chapman University School of Pharmacy, Irvine, California. Chapman uh, is a private institution of a great vision. It is an institution with, uh, uh, with uh, a clear understanding and a, and a universal character. He earned his ph pharmacy degree from Tehran University of Medical Sciences. And I wish to remind you that Tehran University is one of the oldest universities in uh, West Asia and also a very prestigious one in 1989. He received his PhD in medicinal chemistry from the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Alberta in 1997, followed by a postdoctoral study in the field of solid phase organic synthesis in the Department of Chemistry, University of Alberta. He pursued additional postdoctoral studies at the Rockefeller University in New York and Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He joined the University of Rhode Island in October 2000 and became a full professor in July 2008. He served as a program coordinator of Rhode Island uh, IDEA Network of Biomedical Research Excellence, which was a major NIH initiative which he looked after for several years. He joined Chapman University to assist in the establishment of the School of Pharmacy. He is uh, an author of uh, over 200 research papers. 10 patents, 170 meeting abstract. So you see, he has been a very prolific uh, uh, writer of uh, very high quality publication. His specific research areas currently under investigation include using peptides as cell penetrating molecules, uh, molecular transporters in the drug delivery, designing protein kinase inhibitors, developing multifunctional antiviral anti cancer antibacterial agent, I remember my discussion with him. And he was mentioning about Professor Ehrlich's early dream of developing uh, a magic bullet, you know, as a molecule which is capable of, uh, of treating many, many diseases. So he's actually on that very path. Uh, he also worked on designing of peptide nanomaterial, nanomaterial for nanomedicine. One major area currently under investigation to design peptide nanomaterial for application in doctor delivery. So uh, we looked into the profile of uh, Dr. Prang and we found that with his very strong background in pharmacy, organic chemistry and pharmacology, he is uh, one ideal biochem uh, medicinal chemist which is uh, equipped with tools and knowledge and understanding of various subjects required for this interdisciplinary science. He has been instrumental in developing lots of collaboration initially of University of Rhode Island and now in Ch Chapman University. And I'm sure that you would enjoy his talk. He has been a very inspiring speaker. So Dr. Prang, over to you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Akbal. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation and also for great introduction. And I want to thank Dr. Siddiqui and Kazime for organizing and uh, supporting this event. Uh, and I hope uh, I can uh, give you some information that uh, by the end of uh, my talk, uh, you can use it in your research and also your education. So uh, thank you so much. I, uh, I just want to share my screen and uh, just, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So the title of uh, my talk is about prodrugs uh, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Uh, so, as Dr. Chaudhary mentioned, uh, I'm working at Chapman University. Chapman University is uh, in uh, Southern California. And uh, also I had another talk a few weeks ago. I'd be delighted to host any of you who come to California anytime uh, and uh, uh, you know network and 
talk about collaboration in future. So uh, let's talk about prodrugs. Uh, as you know, uh, prodrugs are inactive compound uh, which are converted to active compound in the body. And this uh, concept has been around for a long time. So usually we have a drug that is the active moiety and we uh, mask it with the carrier or pro moiety that can be converted back to drug. Sometimes uh, the conversion is done by chemical uh, process and sometimes we have a, a enzymatic trigger or other type of trigger. So we're going to talk about that uh, shortly. So in general, when you have a drug, and as you know, there are many, many uh, small molecule drugs have been developed, and many of them have a, a significant uh, biological activity, but we always have a challenge with absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination, and toxicity that we call it ADMIT. And uh, many of the drugs in clinical trial uh, 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 fail, even they are very potent because of many of issue we have with each one of these. There could be limited absorption, uh, extensive metabolism, or fast elimination, or toxicity, and lack of tolerance in the patient, and so on. So the prodrug is actually a, a smart concept that we can use to modify admit property and without compromising the drug uh, biological activity. And uh, uh, this is a, 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 a general way to improve the biological activity of the compound that have desirable efficacy, but not uh, desirable uh, admit property. So if we want to show that uh, in general, we have an active drug uh, and we have a barrier, this barrier, it could be a phospholipid bi bilayer barrier. It could be different other type of barrier. It could be a blood brain barrier and, uh, uh, and also uh, uh, we may have uh, poor permeability of the drugs across the cell membrane. So we have to find a way to bypass this different type of barrier to make sure the drug can have good absorption. And some of these barriers I mentioned here, we have uh, limited solubility of the compound, we have poor permeability, we have uh, also toxicity barrier, we have a poor physical chemical property of compound. And uh, sometimes we have metabolism and extracellular metabolism of the compound. So the compound is already metabolized before it reached to the target. And sometimes we want to have a control release property, a sustained release property and so we can have a longer acting effect of the compound. Or we might, we might want to have drug targeting, for example, in many anti-cancer compounds that have a, a, a extensive toxicity in other tissue. So the concept is very simple. As you know, we have a drug that attach it to promoity and make it a, as an inactive compound. We call it prodrug. This prodrug has a good physical chemical property to bypass many of these barriers that I mentioned and be delivered to the cells and then undergo different type of biotransformation or uh, chemical transformation and generate the active drug and uh, carrier. The most important thing that we need to consider this promoity or carrier has to uh, be inactive, it doesn't, shouldn't have a toxicity and also it should be biodegradable. So we don't have, uh, uh, we may solve a problem, but we don't rise another problem by generating a toxic chemical moiety. So this promoity has to be eliminated and active drug can uh, be delivered to the body bypassing many of these barriers that I mentioned. 
So the prototype concept is not novel. And in, indeed, uh, we had the first uh, prototype uh, in 1853. As you know, aspirin is very old drug, uh, acetylsalicylic acid, and it was marketed uh, in 1899. At that time, we didn't know it's a prodrug, but uh, um, eventually we found out that actually it's converted to uh, salicylic acid that, uh, uh, as we know, is caused a GI uh, irritation and uh, aspirin has less uh, toxicity in GI tract. But if we go back even to 1899, we had a compound metanamine that uh, uh, commercialized, that is actually, we're talking about 120 years ago. That is amazing that they came up with this uh, concept that metanamine uh, can be used for urinary tract infection. So they made this compound intentionally in 1899. And in the urine, we have acidic environment and it can generate formaldehyde and this formaldehyde uh, can have anti-infective activity against bacteria. So again, 1899, we have the first intentional prodrug, but as acetic salicylic acid was uh, around uh, 50 years earlier than that. But then we have 1931, uh, 25, we have this antibiotic prontosil as you know, it was discovered and uh, uh, by accident for the sulfonamide derivative antibacteria. In 1958, actually the 10 prodrug uh, was introduced by Adrian Albert. So uh, even we had prodrug before, but nobody used this term before. And uh, this was the first time uh, the person who uh, uh, talk about prodrug as an inactive moiety that can be converted to active drug. And after that, we have an explosion of many different type of prodrug came to the market and uh, many of them uh, 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 become some of the best selling drug in the market, as you know. And this continue until today that I'm going to give you several examples uh, shortly. So in general, uh, all of you know that the prodrug have three component. One component is uh, uh, drug with functional group. The second component, you have a carrier or promoity. And these two are connected with each other with a linker. And this cleavable linker uh, uh, can be degraded in vivo in the body and generate the uh, uh, active drug uh, inside the body. So uh, we need to have these three components. And sometimes uh, we call this is a classical form of prodrug. Sometimes we don't have uh, a linker. Sometimes uh, the prodrug is not actually generated by degradation. Sometimes the prodrug is generated by anabolism. So the compound, the compound we have that actually itself is a prodrug and has to undergo metabolism to generate the active drug. So this illustration is mostly a classical uh, way to show it, but later on I'm going to show you different type of prodrug that they don't follow this uh, concept. And these kind of prodrug, uh, uh, they are actually, we call them uh, bio precursor. So they actually converted to active drug uh, uh, when they go into the body uh, later on. So they don't have a link, they have to undergo metabolism. Okay, so if you want to look at the role of prodrug in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, about 10% of all the drugs actually are prodrug. Uh, many of them are small molecule drugs. And this is increasing every year. Uh, so we have so many prodrugs on the market that uh, 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 
you may not realize that uh, we've been using them, but then um, they act as an inactive uh, compound and they will convert to the active drug uh, in the body. So there are many classes of the compound. I just get some example here, antibacterial, antiviral, anti-cancer, many cardio cardiovascular disease uh, drugs uh, um, that are used against cardiovascular diseases. These are some examples of antibacterial prodrug, uh, uh, pyrapicillin, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, becampicillin, uh, hetacillin, uh, and these are, as you can see here, these are ester prodrug, so they are a derivative of ampicillin, and they've been using them to improve the bioavailability of many antibiotics or cephalosporin derivative. But sometimes we have a product like uh, 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 this compound, uh, saltamicillin, that actually is a, a combination of two different drugs. Or sometimes, as I mentioned, we have some simple drug like isoniazid that it doesn't have a linker, but it will be converted in the body to active drug. Uh, uh, after uh, metabolism. The same thing, uh, this is isoniazide, uh, as you know, is used against uh, uh, tuberculosis. And we have metronidazole that active against helicobacter. And this compound is also uh, not active by itself. It has to undergo metabolism uh, to be converted to antibacterial agent. This is uh, antibiotic uh, ceftarolin uh, uh, that this compound actually uh, uh, has a phosphate group. And again, uh, I'm going to talk about this shortly. So this is kind of a compound that is used to improve the uh, physical chemical property and improve the uh, active, uh, delivery of the antibiotic. So there are many antibacterial uh, prodrugs. These are just some examples. Similarly, we have a lot of uh, antiviral prodrugs. Antiviral prodrugs have been used for a long time. Uh, we have gancyclovir, pancyclovir, and many um, anti-HIV agents like uh, uh, zytovirin was the first anti-HIV agent was developed. But now we have MTCitabin, Lamivudin, and Zalcitabin. Again, these are kind of products that I mentioned earlier. They don't have a linker and are not attached to any carrier. They, they themselves are a product, but when they get into the uh, infections uh, cells, like HIV infected cells, they have to be activated, for example, for anti HIV agent or for herpes, they have to be activated. And this type of anti-HIV drug or antiviral drug, uh, these are nucleoside derivative, they have to undergo a uh, phosphorylation and uh, uh, they get into the DNA of the cells and uh, uh, the viruses and they cause the uh, chain termination. So the phosphorylation happen and they become active. So they are not a classical type of prodrug that uh, they have a link. So if we look at the common functional group that we have uh, for prodrugs, uh, you, you can see that uh, uh, many of these compounds, uh, uh, they have a functional group like alcohol, carboxylic acid, amine, carbonyl, or thiol derivative. And then we have uh, uh, different type of linker that can be attached to this functional group and generate the carbonate, the amide, the carbamide, and so on, even disulfide. And the commonly used uh, uh, functional group and linker usually are carboxylic acid and alcohol to generate ester derivative. But then we also have a lot of uh, hydrazone and imine and uh, thioether and uh, disulfide bleach. So this, as I told you, these are in the drugs 
and this is the link. And then we have some uh, release trigger that can be used to uh, separate the active drug from the link. So several of them uh, could be chemical uh, hydrolysis uh, and uh, pH, but also we have several conditions in our body that can be manipulated to deliver the drug selectively to desirable target. So this could be enzymatic. For example, many cancer cells uh, have a specific overexpressed enzyme that can be used to deliver cancer uh, anti-cancer drug to them. Could be pH. So we have an uh, uh, endosome in the, inside the cell that uh, can release a, a linker from the active drug. We have a, a reduction and oxidation species uh, uh, and uh, reactive oxygen species that they can be involved in uh, release of many of these uh, uh, functional groups from the linker. And so these are uh, also different type of trigger that we can use. So if you want to have a, a smart delivery to a specific target, we can use different type of trigger to uh, make sure the drug is actually released in the target, not in a place that is not desirable and cause toxicity. So we're going to talk later on a little bit about this uh, shortly. So why we using prodrug? There are many advantages of using prodrug that, that uh, um, we can categorize in four, uh, five different groups, pharmacokinetic property, formulation property, uh, also uh, uh, you know, optimization, pharmacodynamic and toxicity. Pharmaco pharmacokinetic property, as I told you, we're trying to improve the ADME property, absorption, elimination, metabolism, uh, you know, uh, uh, improving the uptake and so on, passing the blood-brain barrier. Formulation property, sometimes you have uh, limited solubility, sometimes uh, you have uh, 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 some functional group that undergo metabolism so quickly, so we want to mask them, or they're very polar, they don't pass the uh, membrane or blood brain barrier, so we want to make them uh, more uh, uh, hydrophobic. Or uh, on the other side, we can also uh, improve the water solubility. Sometimes we want to improve the water solubility of the compound because the compounds are very hydrophobic and they cannot be delivered. Also, there are a process optimi optimization. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, there are uh, 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 some drugs that are in the market, and as Dr. Chaudhary mentioned, there is a major uh, concept to repurpose many of these drugs rather than to go to develop new type of drugs. So you can use a commercially available drug and improve the physical, chemical, or biological activity and generate new uh, drugs, but then. Uh, because many of these prodrugs undergo conversion to active drug, the regulatory process will be much simplified because we already know the safety profile and toxicity of that drug. Many pharmaceutical companies, they also use uh, prodrugs to extend the uh, patent coverage. So they modify the structure a little bit and they can uh, generate some new chemical ent entity and de develop it with in some improvement in biological activity and physical chemical property as a new drug and extend the uh, uh, marketability of active drug they already have. There are pharmacodynamic application. As I told you, you want to improve metabolism. Uh, uh, you want to uh, uh, also uh, allow intracellular conversion. So this is more about pharmacology and uh, improving the biological activity and also reducing the toxicity of the compound. And as I told you, we can use the trigger-based uh, release and smart delivery to reduce the toxicity. 
So uh, with that, let me give you some example of uh, highlighted application of prodrugs. We can improve the membrane permeability, we can prolong activity, reduce the toxicity, improve the water solubility or reduce the water solubility and drug targeting and improving chemical stability. So I'm going to give you some example of this. And uh, after this, uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, uh, different type of product that are in the market and also some emerging product uh, that uh, uh, develop uh, based on the new technology, uh, especially uh, uh, nanomedicine and enzyme mediated uh, release. And after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research uh, that uh, related to product just a few applications that we have used in our research. So the first group of product that uh, application is improved membrane permeability. I'm sure you are aware that uh, we have a drug uh, called uh, Levodopa that is used against uh, Parkinson's disease. And as you know, the dopamine is uh, uh, useful in treating of Parkinson's Parkinson disease, but it's uh, too polar to cross the uh, cell membrane and blood brain barrier. So if you use dopamine directly to the patient, uh, you don't get very high concentration in the brain cell for treatment of Parkinson's disease. So what they did, uh, uh, they used the uh, L-dopa. L-dopa has very similar structure with dopamine, except you have a uh, carboxylic acid here. And, uh, this carboxylic acid is very sensitive to decarboxylation with the dopa decarboxylase. So if you use L-dopa uh, L or levodopa, it's going to be decarboxylated and uh, um, um, uh, then uh, it's going to generate uh, dopamine. But the problem is that uh, we want to, uh, to deliver L-dopa uh, inside the brain cell first. So they, they use a carbidopa. Carbidopa actually inhibit the decarboxylate, dopa decarboxylase, and L-dopa can get to the brain cells and then uh, undergo uh, metabolism over there and uh, generate dopamine. And then we can, that can be used for treatment of the Parkinson. So L-dopa so is actually is a product uh, to improve the membrane permeability, but it's always used with the carbidopa to inhibit the uh, decarboxylase. The way it works is there is a transporter for L-dopa, so uh, this L-dopa can be bound to the transporter protein and uh, pass the blood-brain barrier and uh, be uh, transported uh, and then undergo metabolism and generate the dopamine uh, inside the nerve cell. So that is uh, uh, a specific transporter that in, uh, can be used for this prodrug to be delivered to the uh, nerve cell. So another example that uh, I'm giving here is uh, for improving the membrane permeability. Uh, a drug called uh, enalapril. Uh, this is an uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor that is used for high blood, blood pressure and hypertension. So this compound has a ethyl ester group and the active drug is a carboxylic acid. The active drug has a very low oral bioavailability, but when you add the ester, ester group, uh, group, you have an improved bioavailability by 60%. And then also you can use it as a tablet. But the active drug, enalapilate, it can be used only by IV because it has a very short half-life. So just with simple modification, uh, this can be converted to active drug in the presence of esterase uh, and this uh, uh, carboxylic acid is required for bonding to angiotensin converting enzyme. So um, um, that we have an active multifunctional group that uh, cause the efficacy of this compound. So this is another example to improve the membrane permeability. 
sometimes we use prodrug to prolong the activity. And uh, one example is uh, uh, six mercaptopurin uh, is a, a compound that has a thiol group. It's a very old drug. Uh, it's immunosuppressive agent, but it has a very short half-life and eliminated from the body quickly. So what they did, they uh, developed this imidazole, for uh, um, uh, nitro imidazole derivative, attach it to the thiol group, and it show very slow conversion to uh, six mercaptopurin, and it has a longer half-life. And the person who developed this type of code like uh, uh, won Nobel Prize in 1988. And this compound, again, it has avail uh, commercially available as a tablet, so you can put oral bioavailability and a slow conversion to active drug. And this undergo further metabolism conversion to 6 tyro guanidine, uh, guanine that this compound later on was found to have anti-cancer activity against leukemia. So it generated a new area of anti-cancer research later on. So the third application that I'm going to talk about is uh, using uh, prodrugs to mask uh, toxicity and side effects. So one uh, simple example, as I mentioned, is aspirin. It's a prodrug uh, of uh, uh, Acetylic, acetyl salicylic acid that is converted to salicylic acid. As you know, salicylic acid is uh, anti-inflammatory and uh, but it causes stomach ulcers and irritation in GI tract because of this um, uh, phenolic acidic group, weak acidic group. And on the other hand, when you mask it with the acetyl group, it's hydrolyzed by esterase in the bloodstream slowly. So uh, that is one of the most uh, commonly used uh, drugs that we have in the market. So another example that uh, uh, you may also have heard is cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide is the anti-cancer agent. The uh, area of alkylating agent in cancer, uh, when you have nitrogen mastered, uh, that uh, your nitrogen that is attached to two chlorine uh, group uh, with the two uh, met uh, methylene group. These compounds are very active and they have very uh, extensive uh, toxicity. So they came up with this idea that uh, we make this uh, nitrogen master uh, less active. And then uh, this has undergo metabolism in the liver. And in the liver, uh, it slowly, uh, several steps, it generates the nitrogen master the, that is, uh, has the alkylating activity, but much more selective compared to the alkylating agent. Many of alkylating agents that are in the market, uh, they are used by injectable form because uh, they are very active. If you use them orally, they cause significant GI toxicity. So cyclophosphamide is one of the um, um, alkylating agent that uh, is actually non-toxic prodrug and is used uh, as oral administration also. And it undergo metabolism with the liver with cytochrome P450 and is converted to um, active uh, master derivative. So it reduces uh, GI toxicity and uh, it can be used uh, orally compared to other DNA alkylating agents that cause alkylation of the different guanine bases in DNA. So this is a product actually that has been developed to reduce the toxicity of alkylating agent. Okay, so the next application that we have is uh, Prodrug to lower uh, water solubility of the compound. And one simple example that you all know, uh, chloramphenicol palmitate is just a, a prodrug of chloramphenicol that is converted by pancreatic lipase uh, to active drug. 
And this is uh, used uh, for improvement of the taste, but we want to reduce the water solubility. Because when it's water soluble, soluble it has a, a very uh, nasty taste and they make it as a suspension. Uh, so reduce the solubility in the saliva and is less soluble on the tongue and you, you don't feel the taste of this compound when you consume it, especially for children that uh, are very sensitive to bad taste of the dry. So this is to lower water solubility. On the other hand, we can improve uh, also water solubility of many prodrugs. Uh, another step different example of chloramphenicol, we have chloramphenicol succinate. Chloramphenicol succinate, the succinate is added to chloramphenicol to improve the solubility because you get a, a sodium salt, a sodium cal uh, carboxylate salt, uh, a succinate salt of chloramphenicol that undergo um, hydrolysis with esterase and generate chloramphenicol and sodium succinate that is not toxic. So this is uh, because we want to improve the water solubility for IV injection. And also we can inject higher concentration, a smaller dose. And uh, because it's more water soluble is not a hydrophobic and lipid form, we have a reduced pain at site of injection. So this is another example of antibiotic that has been used uh, uh, as a prodrug for improving the water solubility. The next application also, I can give you example, clindamycin phosphate is another antibiotic. Again, we have a phosphate group here. This phosphate group is acidic and in the physiological pH, uh, it become ionized. Uh, 7.4, and uh, we have a uh, 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 negatively charged phosphate, and it become more water soluble, uh, so uh, clindamycin become more uh, uh, available for uh, drug absorption. So if, again, this is another example of antibacterial product. And also because of water solubility, uh, if it is used as an injectable form, it's less painful uh, on injection. Another application of prodrug is to target uh, uh, different type of drug. That, uh, as I mentioned, for example, at the beginning, we have metonymine and hexamine is the same name. This compound, uh, one of the oldest prodrug uh, that was intentionally developed. And this is a very uh, interesting molecule that when it uh, goes to the acidic, uh, environment is get hydrolyzed, but is stable and inactive at pH seven more than five. So if you use consume this, uh, 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 it, as far as the pH is more than five, uh, the compound is stable. But when it goes to the urinary tract, uh, pH is less than five and it degrade and generate a formaldehyde and uh, formaldehyde has antibacterial agent. An interesting thing that formaldehyde is very toxic compound that if you consume uh, methanol uh, that uh, converted to formaldehyde, uh, it can cause blindness. But this compound is so in, uh, selective that uh, it doesn't generate formaldehyde in the blood uh, and it goes to the urinary tract to generate formaldehyde. So. The last group that I want to talk about is prodrug to increase the chemical stability of the compound. And this compound is heterosilin, is another antibiotic. And this is converted to ampicillin. Ampicillin has interesting um, uh, biological activity, but the problem is that this nitrogen that uh, amino group can attack to this beta lactone and open this ring and make the an ampicillin uh, inactive. So they came up with this idea, maybe we should block this amino group and put it part of the lock nitrogen in heterocillin 
So this is not active or uh, it kind of widget. It become a secondary amino group rather than primary amino group. So it cannot affect this beta lactam. Uh, and as you know, this uh, ampicillin beta lactam are in, in important antibiotics that inhibit the cell wall synthesis. And this beta lactam is important. So, so this is a product to increase the chemical stability of uh, ampicillin. So uh, uh, ampicillin itself is chemically unstable because this uh, nitrogen group uh, can attach to the beta lactam thing. Okay, so uh, nitrogen atom again in this heterosaline uh, is locked up and within the heterocyclic and we reduce this activity. So uh, this is the first part of my talk. So by this time, you should know what are different applications of prodrugs. Uh, and I only gave you examples about seven of them. But again, there are many, many different applications um, for prodrugs. Is there any question at this time? Uh, uh, so, or I can continue again. Uh, if you have any question, I can answer now, or otherwise I continue. Okay, look like there is no question. Uh, please don't hesitate to ask me any question anytime, uh, and uh, oh. I'm sure Professor, I'm uh, uh, looking I'm at sorry the chat to, to see whether there is any question. Okay. Uh, uh. But now you know the application of port drug and you know how important are port drugs in uh, different uh, biological activity and physical chemical improvement and so on. But we, we need to know what type of port drug we want to develop. There are different types of port drug. One type of port drug are carrier link or promoity. That is a classical one that I mentioned. And another one are uh, bio precursors that are different type of uh, prodrugs that we're going to uh, talk about it shortly. For the carrier link or promoity, we have different type of class of prodrug. We have bipartite prodrug, we have tripartite prodrug, and we have uh, mutual uh, prodrug or double prodrug, or we call them also codrugs. So uh, each one of these have different application. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about the carrier link uh, type of prodrug and then go to the bio precursor prodrugs uh, and tell you some example of it. So carrier link prodrugs are just cl classical uh, prodrug that I already mentioned to you. So you have a, a, a drug with a functional group attached with the promoity, and you can attach them directly, or you can have a linker uh, between them. If they are attached directly, we call them uh, uh, bipartite. If you have additional promoity, we call them tripartite. And both of these uh, uh, inert uh, link carrier or promoity will be degraded and undergo hydrolysis or enzymatic or chemical transformation and generate drug and promoity. In this case, you have three uh, sections. You have first promoity and second promoity. The second promoity undergo enzymatic separation, and then uh, um, you have a chemical uh, hydrolysis uh, spontaneously generate the uh, drug. So we have enzymatic and chemical uh, together. Okay, so it's just a two-step process. So we're going to talk about these two uh, first and give you some examples. So one uh, typical example about the bipartite uh, prodrug we can call pamcyclovir. Pamcyclovir has a two acetyl group okay, and this uh, active drug is directly attached to the promoity and esterase is going to cleave this uh, acetyl group. Generate the 
active compound that undergo metabolism and oxidase uh, uh, forms a pancyclovir. This pancyclovir itself is also prodrugged. It's converted to monophosphate, diphosphate, and triphosphate that is DNA polymerase in heat. But the original prodrug is actually a bipartite uh, prodrug that is converted to uh, pancyclovir by hydrolysis of acetyl group and then oxidation. So there is no linkage between the uh, active moiety and this acetyl group. This is uh, uh, available as a tablet uh, in commercially available. Another interesting example is uh, ceftaroline uh, uh, is an antibiotic that has a phosphate group and it can pass the membrane, uh, plasma membrane, and then this phosphate group, uh, group is going to be dephosphorylated by phosphatase and converted to active uh, uh, antibiotic that is ceftaroline. And again, uh, this is uh, just an uh, active moiety connected to, pro -drug, to the drug moiety directly. There is no link here between them. So that's why this is a bipartite uh, prodrug. Tripartite prodrugs, uh, as I mentioned, you have a drug, you have a carrier and linker. Again, uh, is uh, inactive. At the first step, you have enzymatic process removing the carrier and then you have a spontaneous chemical hydrolysis and generate the drug. So the first step is a chemical process. The second step is a spontaneous uh, chemical uh, degradation. So I give you some example of this uh, shortly, but this is uh, commonly used, uh, especially when you have an enzyme that uh, is uh, present in a specific uh, tissue or organ, and you want, for example, this compound to get hydrolyzed only in that tissue. So you can make it very selective for uh, uh, targeting. So one good example of this is uh, the compicillin. The compicillin is, uh, again, another antibiotic that uh, has a drug uh, linking structure and carrier all together. So the way it works, this is a ampicillin derivative, but it has an ester group uh, and then uh, another ester group, uh, another uh, diester group here. So you have uh, a chemical uh, enzymatic hydrolysis of this uh, uh, ester group so you uh, buy esterase and uh, you have a, a conversion of this compound released of ethyl group to ethanol. And then you have this negative charge that undergo a spontaneous reaction and generate uh, ampicillin uh, immediately. So you have uh, enzymatic and then uh, a spontaneous chemical uh, uh, intermolecular and in chemical reaction that generate the active antibody. Again, you have a drug, you have a linking structure, and you have another carrier that is get hydrolyzed uh, by enzyme. Okay. So, so now you know what is bipartite and what is tripartite uh, product. Then we have mutual prodrugs, uh, another kind of carrier uh, prodrug. In this case, we have two pharmacological active agents attached to each other. So you have one parent drug that has its own biological activity, has its own metabolism. You have another drug of biological activity, it has its own metabolism. And then uh, when uh, you have in vivo, they are separated and you have one parent drug and another drug, both of them could have biological activity at the same time. So we call this mutual prodrug. The thing is that these two parent and um, 
right, could be attached to each other directly. So they could be bipartite or they could have a linker between them. So they could be tripartite. But the reason we call them mutual polarized because we have two drives or some people, they call it double polarized. Some people, they call them co-drives. So one good example is uh, Eswamustin uh, is an anti-cancer agent against uh, prostate cancer. So you have a stradiol attached to the uh, nitrogen master at the same time. And when it undergoes hydrolysis, you have a master and stradiol. And again, uh, the compound uh, used to uh, uh, for metastatic carcinoma, prostate, and again, uh, you use uh, stradiol uh, actually to deliver this uh, to the prostate uh, because it's steroid. And also uh, this compound itself has uh, uh, some um, a slow uh, uh, effect on the prostate cell growth. So it can reduce the growth of the prostate cell. So you have two kind of anti-cancer agent at the same time. Another good example is a combination of cephalosporin and uh, ciprofloxacin. This is a mutual prodrug that, that uh, uh, as you notice, you have ciprofloxacin here and you have a cephalosporin. And uh, this uh, beta lactamase can open the beta lactam group. And then we have this electron delocalization that uh, actually kick out the ciprofloxacin. So we have a beta lactamase mediated activation, enzymatic activation, and you generate the ciprofloxacin and also cephalotin analog. Both of them have antibiotic activity. So this way uh, you have a double prodrug at the same time. Again, uh, this is kind of mutual prodrug. So there are other examples of the mutual product you can find uh, commercially available. One is uh, benorylate. Benorylate is actually anti-inflammatory um, agent. So you have a attachment of aspirin and uh, acetaminophen at the same time through the ester group. So you generate a synergistic effect from two anti-inflammatory agents. In this case, uh, sultamisulin, that is interesting compound, that uh, this compound actually, uh, sultamisulin, uh, this is, uh, has a salbactam and also ampicillin. Salbactam is attached to ampicillin, but this is a uh, uh, beta-lactamase uh, uh, beta uh, inhibitor. So in, the, it inhibits the beta lactamase uh, uh, for resistant bacteria, specifically that inactivate the ampicillin. So it reduces inactivation of ampicillin at the same time. So you have a, a, a compound a prodrug that one um, drug actually inhibits the metabolism of the other part. So the compound can remain active and go to the cell wall of the bacteria has can, and can have antibacterial activity. So that's the uh, end the uh, first group of prodrug that is carrier uh, prodrug that was uh, bipartite, uh, tripartite, and mutual prodrug. But as you remember, I mentioned that we have different types of prodrug. We call them biopercursor. These are actually in a molecule, they undergo chemical modification, but they don't have a carrier. Usually you, they become activated by metabolism like uh, reduction, oxidation, or uh, activated by different enzymes. A classical example of this is prontosil. You remember Alexander Domag uh, who was working uh, um, in Bayer company and they were looking for some antibiotic and this guy uh, uh, used this uh, 
compound uh, for infection for his daughter. Had, uh, his daughter got infected and uh, he used this without informing the company. And then uh, he realized that it has antibiotic activity. Because of generation of sulfonamide, uh, prantosil is actually metabolized to this uh, sulfonyl amide and gen also generate uh, aniline derivative. So this uh, generated a new generation of sulfonamide derivative that we already use them even now. Another example I just mentioned a few minutes ago, cyclophosphamide that is activated in liver and generate the master derivative and it generate the oral bioavailability of the alkylating agent. Again, we don't have any um, carrier here. The compound is undergo metabolism and become active. Cyclovir is another example of biopicursor and many antiviral drugs actually follow, fall into this category. So a cyclovir, as you know, is used against the herpes simplex virus. There is an enzyme, a specific enzyme, timing kinase in the viruses. So it phosphorylates the cyclovir and uh, then uh, you have a diphosphorylation and triphosphorylation that cause a chain termination in DNA. The major uh, interesting enzyme is a time-eating kinase that is in viruses. So only viruses can exclusively phosphorylate this compound and make it active. The other cells that are not infected, they are not going to do this. So that's why a cyclovir even is an old drug, is still used as antiviral drug because it's quite uh, selective for the herpes uh, that has a timing kinase. If you have a resistant herpes that uh, you, you have lack of timing kinase, then uh, cyclovir cannot work. So we have to use other different type of uh, antiviral drug. But again, this is a biopicursor for drug because it's not active by itself, is activated by phosphorylation, diphosphorylation, and triphosphorylation. So, so far what I have talked to you is about the classical example of prodrug. And uh, there are a new development in the area of the prodrugs that I want you to have some idea because many of these emerging technology are in clinical trial or they're coming to the market shortly. They are a little bit more complex compared to a small molecule type of prodrug, but they have a significantly more extensive application. So you may have heard about prodrug-based self-assembly nanomaterial or uh, enzyme-specific functional uh, prodrug. So these are two classes that I'm going to talk to you uh, in brief, uh, so you have uh, some knowledge uh, about this when these come to uh, literature and uh, also you can use them in your research. So in general, when we're talking about conjugating a, a drug uh, to a carrier amphiphilic uh, polymer or other type of nanoparticle that this uh, polymers uh, can undergo self-assembly. So this self-assembly, as you know, there is a very important process. So when we're talking about self-assembly, consider that cell membrane is a, a self-assembled structure of phospholipid bilayer. DNA is a self-assembled double-stranded uh, chain that uh, we have halogen bonding between the different nucleotide bases. So the same concept here, we can use amphiphilic compound to self-assemble and we use this for specific application. In, in general, for nanomedicine, we can reduce the renal clearance 
because you have a larger molecule. This larger molecules uh, have a less tendency to metabolize fast and uh, uh, undergo filtration in the uh, kidney. Also, we reduce the metabolism because we protect the drug. So the en enzymatic uh, metabolism will be diminished or reduced because the drug is encapsulated or self-assembled inside the package. One major application is you can use multiple or tunable drug uh, release mechanism. Uh, so that way you can have a specific delivery to tissue and you can uh, smartly adjust it. So you can make the drug release uh, based on the condition you have. Uh, it could be externally or it could be internally. So you can have a external uh, factor to make the drug release, or you can have an internal uh, factor that are available in tissue environment to make the drug release. And this can happen using the nanomaterial. And again, uh, there are uh, many different nanomaterials. You can do surface modification and make them more selective to target. For example, you can have a targeting ligand on the surface of nanomaterial that can go only to a specific tissue. Traditionally, we have used antibody to target different type of tissue selectively. But now we know that antibody are not um, exclusively selective and they have some their own issue and cost of uh, synthesis of those compound uh, antibody drug conjugate is much more compared to if using a, a poor drug concept. Okay, so let me give you some example of various type of nanoparticle drug delivery system. So you have polymeric nanomaterial, we have lipid-based nanomaterial, you have also inorga inorganic nanocarrier. And many of these have been developed or have been used uh, previously. For example, liposome, uh, solid lipid nanoparticle, uh, micelles, and so on have been around for a long time. And each one of them have major advantage and disadvantage uh, in terms of leakage, in terms of how much loading they can provide uh, for the encapsulation and so on. More application uh, coming and through for polymer. Polymers uh, are more diverse. Uh, you can have different type of polymer. So when I'm talking about polymer, it's not only uh, uh, synthetic uh, compound, it could be also peptide, uh, it could be different type of polymers that uh, can be self-assembled and uh, hydrogel, dandrimer, and so on, and they can be used for encapsulating of drugs. These are two different classes of nanoparticle drug delivery system. Inorganic nanocarrier has been also used, but these are mostly used for imaging, but some of them like growth nanoparticles are very good uh, biodegradable and not very toxic. Uh, and some of them like magnetic nanoparticle has been used uh, uh, for delivery and also tunable uh, delivery of the compound. Um, so if you can use the heat uh, and uh, you can use the magnetic nanoparticle, they are thermosensitive uh, stimulus release of compound. Carbon nanotube uh, uh, was a hot topic a few years ago, but then we know that, uh, you know, single wall or multi wall carbon nanotube, uh, uh, there was a controversial about the toxicity of this compound. Quantum dot uh, has been used mostly for imaging uh, uh, application, but there are mostly uh, inorganic cadmium that are usually toxic, but they have a very good uh, imaging property. So how about we use this application of nanomedicine with the application of prodrug at the same time and come up with some new type of uh, delivery system. So we call them prodrug-based nanomedicine. 
and they can have uh, a stimuli uh, responsive uh, release of the compound. So you can have a prodrug based on the polymer. You can have prodrug based on the small molecule, or you can have a encapsulation of nanomedicine. So we call this emerging area prodrug based nanomedicine. And uh, this is becoming a very uh, diverse application for uh, not only uh, delivery, but also for targeting specifically to uh, tissue using the uh, stimuli responsive pathway. So I give you some example how this is working. So if you're talking about different type of prodrug nanoparticles, you can do it two different ways. So you can have a prodrug itself that is a classical prodrug that we have and encapsulate it inside the nanocarrier encapsulation of this prodrug inside nanocarrier, you can have a prodrug encapsulated nanoparticle. This is one way to do it. The second way to do it, uh, we don't need a nanocarrier. The drug, the um, prodrug itself, it can uh, self-assemble by itself and generate a nanoparticle by itself. So we have this uh, compound that it could be attached to amphiphilic compound, polymer, peptide, and so on, and self-assemble and generate nanoparticles. So when we're talking about self-assemble of compound that are amphiphilic, we're talking about amphiphilic that have charge or hydrophobic residue. So hydrophobic residue love each other and charge residue they can have hydrogen bonding with each other and we have a nanoparticle like this. Okay. So let's give you one example of this doxorubicin conjugate that undergoes self-assembly. So you have a oligoethylene glycol a polymer here and you have a linker and you have a doxorubicin that is attached to the amino group. So you have an imine group here. So this hydrophilic group, they are on the surface. They want to be exposed to the water molecule and this uh, uh, doxorubicin that is blocked amino group is inside and we have this linker. So when this uh, uh, undergoes self-assembly, you have this nanoparticle. But then uh, when it goes to the endosome, that is acidic property, this amine group will be cleaved and this amino group is, will be released, become polar and uh, will be kicked out of the endosome because of positive charge. So this way you can deliver doxorubicin, even it goes to the endosome, but because acidic environment of endosome and lysosome, uh, it can be released. Uh, so this nanoparticle is formed for delivery, but when it goes to the cell, it will go into uh, uh, degraded and doxorubicin that is in the middle will be released. So that is kind of a, a combination of uh, poor drugs and nanomedicine that improve the delivery at the same time. The second class of the emerging technology are enzyme specific functional poor drugs. So in this way, we have an Several drugs, especially this is used on oncology. We have anti-cancer drugs that are very cytotoxic. We have doxorubicin, paclitaxel, and so on. And then we have a cleavable linker. This cleavable linker is sensitive to a specific enzyme. So these are not just a chemical linker that what we had in traditional drugs. There are very specific uh, amino acid or uh, glycosidic uh, bond or so on that are uh, sensitive to a specific enzyme. And then you have a, a additional targeting moiety. So you can have targeting ligand or light responsive moiety or other nanoparticle at the same time. So these are enzyme specific because they only act in the presence of a specific enzyme. 
to clip this and release the drug. They are quite stable if, unless we have exposure to a specific enzyme. Let's give you one example here. Again, I'm here, I have here doxorubicin. And as you know, doxorubicin is a very commonly used anti-cancer drug and it has a red color. And it, you can actually use, uh, see the uh, red color when it's injected uh, under the skin. And um, that's why even when you make a nanoparticle, you can actually see the red color in nanoparticle. So uh, you see here, it's attached to a linker cat, uh, that is four amino acids, uh, phenylalanine, uh, arginine, arginine, and uh, glycine. We call it FRRG. So this linker is very sensitive to uh, catepsin B. Catepsin B is a cysteine protease that only cleave a specific sequence of amino acid. So this conjugate doxorubicin and the uh, linker, it has a property that can self-assemble each, with each other. So you have doxorubicin in the middle and this uh, uh, linker also outside. So you have a nanoparticle, but then uh, in the presence of catepsin, this is uh, degraded. And catepsin is in, um, present in many cancer cells. Many cancer cells have overexpressed catepsin B. So they can cleave this uh, nanoparticle much better compared to the normal cell. So you generate some kind of uh, selectivity here. Okay. So, uh, so right now it's uh, 11.07, so I gave you some background about the classical products and some imaging technology. The imaging technology is a little bit more complex because you have multiple component. So in terms of uh, pharmaceutical industry, they may be uh, more challenging to develop this compound, but uh, there are many of them in uh, clinical trial, but the advantage is that you can have more selectivity, more protection uh, in presence of different metabolizing enzyme and uh, better delivery. So in the remaining uh, minute, uh, uh, I think I have to finish for the next talk and give you some time for question. Give you quick um, an example of product in my research. So recently we published a paper uh, in kind of similar to some of this imaging technology that we have a peptide uh, that has a positively charged arginine on the head and two long chain fatty acid. And this uh, peptide generate a kind of nanoparticle that we can use it to encapsulate sRNA. SRNA and you look at uh, electron microscopy, you can see the cavity in the middle and then uh, you have a bilayer outside. So this SRNA, uh, we can actually uh, uh, compare. If you have free SRNA, we don't have much delivery to the cell. If you have lipofectamine, that is a transfecting agent that is commonly used. If you have a delivery of SRNA, to the cell, but the, as you know, lipofectomy is kind of toxic. You cannot use it in the body. And then you have uh, our uh, peptide lipid nanoparticle. We had two different types of them and we will be able to deliver sRNA to the cell. But this type of plan A, we call it plan A, they are non-toxic compared to uh, lipofectomy. So you can have fluorescence label sRNA inside the cell. And if we want to see the silencing of the protein, we have compared this. So if you have a protein, no treatment, lipofectamine can be used to silence the production of the protein. This sRNA bound to mRNA and degrade it. And in presence of our uh, delivery system, also we had uh, uh, silencing. And if we compare to the lipofectamine, it's comparable to uh, lipofectamine. We have tested in also other protein like SARC uh, 
that we can uh, silence uh, side protein also similar to uh, lipofectamine. So if it's no treatment and in the presence of this uh, delivery system. So the second application of product that I want to talk about is uh, nucleoside analog uh, that uh, anti-HIV agent. So we have a, a fatty acid that have some modest anti-HIV activity that we discovered. And then uh, they actually inhibit an enzyme in the HIV that involved in menstruation. So of different protein in the uh, HIV. So uh, this uh, fatty acid uh, uh, can be conjugated to this type of compound. So we have uh, a menstruation of the protein inhibited by fatty acid, and then we have anti-HIV nucleoside that inhibit reverse transcriptase. And we realized when we conjugate this together, we can uh, inhibit two different enzymes, and methyl transferase and reverse transcriptase. So we have done synthesis of many fatty acid conjugate of different type of nucleoside. And if we look at the parent drug, uh, lamivudine, and then uh, fatty acid conjugated uh, you see that uh, uh, the activity is significantly improved. If, if the acylation is in the hydroxy group, you have significant improvement compared to the parent drug against both the uh, X4 and R5 type of uh, viruses. So you have a lamivudine that IC50 is around 7.5, 2.6, and then with a fatty acid conjugate 0 0.3, 0 0.082. And you have mt is the anti-HIV drug, and we have a fatty acid conjugate that improved the activity uh, at least 24 more. And if this kind of compound also active against the uh, uh, clinical isolate, so we can see that the uh, uh, conjugate is significantly potent compared to the fatty acid plus uh, lamivudine in physical mixture. Again, the conjugate is more potent than physical mixture. Uh, this is also active against multi-drug resistant HIV viruses. Uh, this is lamivudine, and this is a conjugate. So as you can see, we have a kind of a double prodrug here that uh, fatty acid conjugate actually improved the delivery of nucleoside to the HIV infected cell. But on the other hand, the uh, fatty acid itself has also some biological activity. So that's why we get significant improvement compared to the parent analog. The animal study has been done by uh, a different group. They uh, look at the uh, drug level in uh, uh, biopsy mice, infected mice. And then if you have the parent drug uh, uh, release, uh, in the presence of the fatty acid conjugate, you see uh, from zero to four days, we still re have release of uh, lamivudine, but then the parent drug has very uh, limited release. If you go four to 14 days, we still have release, but then uh, the parent drug almost zero. And you can see the uh, production of lamivudine in different tissue like liver, uh, spleen, and uh, lymphatic tissue. That is many places the, uh, like lymphatic tissue that uh, is actually the hidden reservoir for HIV uh, that uh, uh, can be penetrated by this type of protein. Another uh, final example I'm going to give you is a doxorubicin, is an anti-cancer drug. Uh, this combined, uh, compound bond to the DNA and also topoisomerase and intercalate to the DNA and inhibit the topoisomerase. And this compound uh, has a, some major problem. One is the uh, cardiotoxicity. And uh, we were thinking that uh, how we can improve the delivery. And also the second problem is resistance. Many cancer cells also influx the dark solution. So a uh, few weeks ago, I gave a talk and I just here summarized. So we have a uh, peptide that conjugate to doxorubicin. This is actually a prodrug that is attached to a uh, linker. So we have a tripartite uh, uh, prodrug. And this compound actually 
generate dark fluorescein inside the cell. And if you go for 24 hours incubation with ovarian cancer, we don't see much dark fluorescein alone, but then conjugate, we still have a lot of dark fluorescein release inside the cancer cell. We have higher retention, so we reduce the uh, efflux. And the activity is very similar to dark fluorescein. If you have a conjugate, uh, you get uh, improved activity at longer period of time, but then uh, it gets released. So you have um, a conjugate slowly converted to dark fluorescein until completely converted to dark fluorescein 99%. That's a doxorubicin standard. This is the conjugate standard. We incubate the cell to this conjugate. At the beginning, we have a conjugate, very small amount of doxorubicin. But again, uh, you will see the re reduce, reduction of the conjugate and uh, uh, release of doxorubicin until it's converted completely to doxorubicin. Another conjugate uh, that we have a high with cyclic linear peptide attached to doxorubicin. Uh, it has a very good uh, uptake to ovarian cancer cell, but again, it has not much uptake to heart cell, cardiac cell. That's surprisingly, but that's a good advantage because doxorubicin itself has a very high uptake to heart cell and cause cardiotoxicity. So well, as I mentioned earlier, we can use the prodrug to reduce the toxicity of compound. And this tripartite uh, prodrug can, is one good example that we use in our lab. Another example, we have conjugate doxorubicin with a large peptide, WR9 uh, through a linker. And this peptide actually uh, uh, have uh, uh, itself uh, Proton tyrosine kinase inhibitory activity, so it's anti cancer activity. So, if we use the doxorubicin resistance cell, doxorubicin resistance cells, uh, you know, doxorubicin has no activity against this cell, not much. But when you have the conjugate, uh, you see uh, even uh, at one macromolar, uh, you can see after 72 hours significant activity. Here, doxorubicin even after 72 hours has no activity. So you can use this uh, approach to uh, bypass the resistance mechanism by doxorubicin. So as you can see, doxorubicin doesn't get to this cell line because it's resistant. But then if you have doxorubicin conjugate, as I said, uh, it's a red, you can see it inside the cell. Even if you mix doxorubicin with this peptide as a physical mixture, you can see that uh, delivery inside the cell. So it can be used for the uh, delivery of doxorubicin at the same time. Okay, so with that, uh, I just want to conclude that we have several types of prodrug uh, have reached to the market. And uh, uh, as I showed you, there are multiple applications that uh, uh, you saw here in different uh, ways. Uh, some of them are classical and some of them are uh, imaging te technology. And uh, these uh, uh, applications, some of them are to improve the pharmacokinetic and uh, 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 pharmacodynamic drawbacks of active drug. A new technology like nanomedicine has been merged with the prodrug right now and uh, generating novel therapy to uh, be used for uh, difficult to treat indication. So this is a, a very active area of research and uh, many of you may already be working on the prodrug application without being uh, aware of that uh, this is a, a application that have been used. Recently, we have a collaboration with Dr. Siddiqui and uh, some of the PhD students that we are working on the developing products of uh, anti-HIV agent in Pakistan. So, so there is a lot of application we should think about. Uh, uh, and uh, I hope this talk give you some motivation and think about your area of research that how you can uh, combine it with the prodrug application. 
So thank you so much. Uh, uh, so I'd be happy to answer any question, but uh, uh, I think we have a few minutes, but uh, uh, again, I want to thank the organizer for inviting me. And if you have any question, you can email me anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Parang. It was such a wonderful and comprehensive presentation. Hello. Professor Parang, can you hear me? Hello. Hello, Dr. Shano. Yeah, yeah, can hear me, okay. yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. It was really detailed and comprehensive, and I think uh, very well to understand, uh, to understand actually. Um, so we have some questions here. Uh, let me read them out for you. Uh, first of all, we have a question from Ms. Noor. She was asking that, uh, you know, Okay, so first question is, sir, can a mutual pro-drug be referred to as a chimeric molecule or a hybrid molecule? Hello? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can use a, a, a hybrid molecule. When we're talking about a hybrid molecule, uh, we're talking about conjugation of two different molecules. Uh, but again, uh, if you look at different type of pro-drug, if you're talking about uh, bipartite or tripartite, these are hybrid, uh, or mature polydrug, these are hybrid molecules. But then if you're thinking about biopericocer, that this is different type of polydrug, they are not always hybrid. They, they, are, they have their own uh, entity. They have to become activated inside the body to become active. So not all the time there are hybrid, hybrid molecules. So if you're talking about biopericocer, there are a different type of uh, uh, product. Right. Uh, so here is another question. Uh, yes. What is the fate of pro moiety once it has delivered the drug? Okay, that's a good question also. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we need to be very careful when we have a promoity that is released. Uh, it has to be non-toxic and it has to be biodegradable. Usually many of these promoity are metabolized and eliminated from the body. For example, I, I gave you example of uh, fatty acid or ethyl ester or very simple promoity that are biodegradable. Uh, and they can be uh, eliminated. So the fate of this compound, uh, if they are, uh, if we are not seeking activity in promoity, they have to be biodegradable and metabolized and eliminated. Thank you. Uh, so there is another question from Mr. Noor Rahman. He's asking, is there any advantages of pro-drug over the nanocarriers? Uh, Advantage of prodrug over nanocarrier, uh, yeah, there is advantage. Usually nanocarrier uh, application is a little bit more uh, complex and uh, you have to uh, engineer and manipulate uh, the release of the compound uh, and you have to have a specific size of nanoparticle and uh, um, Usually, simple classical prodrugs are much easier to synthesize in terms of uh, pharmaceutical industry manufacturing is much easier. But if you're talking about nanoparticle, uh, even we have several nanoparticles already in the market, you know, to, in, in to convince the regulatory agency to have a standard for this nanoparticle and make sure they don't have toxicity based on the nanoparticle is a little bit more complicated because it's an imaging technology. But right now, the, uh, in terms of ma pharmaceutical manufacturing, prodrugs are much easier to uh, manufacture and regulatory agency uh, are easier uh, to uh, approve them because they already know the activity of the active drug. But when you go into the more complex nanoparticle you have to prove also that your nanoparticle is not toxic and it releases the compound uh, 
uh, specifically uh, in the way you want it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, here is another question from Mr. Azhar Abbas. He's asking, kindly explain why are you calling inactive compounds also as a pro-drug? Pro I think he sort of wants to ask what is the difference between inactive compound and pro-drugs? Okay, so inactive compound, when we're talking about inactive compound, we have two different inactive compounds. So inactive compound that they don't have any activity and they can be eliminated, they don't get converted to anything. They just metabolize and uh, leave the body. But when we're talking about prodrug, they are inactive drug. They have the capacity to be converted to active compound. So there is a significant difference for something that intrinsically inactive and it never get active compared to something like a prodrug that is inactive, but it can be uh, converted to active compounds. So there is a distinct uh, difference, a thin line between them, but um, uh, why we call it prodrug inactive? Because they will be converted to active compound, but we don't call them inactive compound, we call them inactive drug. Right. <clears throat> so here is another question from Mr. Kishore. He's asking, what will be the best method to deliver atropine-like drug through nanotechnology? Uh, so uh, deliver what type of drugs? Atropine, A-T-R-O-P-I-N-E, atropine. Oh, atropine. Atro atropine drug. So this, we're talking about anticholinergic drug. Uh, um, um, so uh, you, I, I don't recall the structure specifically right now, but uh, I can tell you in general, if they are hydrophobic drug, so you, you can think about a nanoparticle that have a hydrophobic uh, core and a hydrophobic shell, hydrophilic shell. But if there are kind of, you're talking about uh, a compound that is hydrophilic, uh, and you want to deliver it with nanoparticles. So you want to design a nanoparticle that has hydrophilic core or hydrophobic sh shell. So uh, you have to look at the physical chemical uh, property of your drug uh, and tune your, make your nanoparticle based on that. But at, um, at this moment, I don't recall the structure of atropine, but I remember it's a very simple structure uh, but uh, uh, look at the functional group of the compound, uh, look at the lipophilicity and polar functional group and see um, what type of uh, 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 what type of nanoparticle you, you want to, why do you want to use a, a nanoparticle? Are you planning to improve the delivery or are you planning to improve the physical chemical property? Are you planning to improve the circulation time? And based on that, design your nanoparticle based on that. Yeah. Right. So he has another question. What would be best polymer for the ophthalmic delivery of polar drugs? Uh, polar drug, like, uh, uh, you know, so uh, if you're talking about polar drugs that uh, uh, you want to uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, they have a better circulation time, so I will suggest to use something, some polymer that have a hydrophilic core and hydrophobic shell. Uh, example, uh, most of the polar drug, for example, if you're talking about peptides, they are biodegradable or some polar drug that biodegradable. Many people use uh, uh, polyethylene glycol to cap the uh, uh, drugs. Uh, so it completely protects the drug from the hydrolysis. Uh, it's also water soluble, so uh, it doesn't generate precipitation. So one example, I can use uh, polyethylene glycol, but there are other polymer like PLGA, uh, polylactic acid also they have been used and they are very good biodegradable that can be used. But again, uh, it all depends on type of drug because even polar drug have different uh, physical chemical property, and they may undergo different type of metabolism. But uh, 
you know, you can think about uh, uh, some hydrophilic uh, polyethylene glycol or PLGA. 